Today, I'm speaking with Jorge Tittinger, CEO of Silicon Graphics International. Please join us in this episode of Substance. So, Jorge, thank you so much for being here today. I'm excited to uh, sit here and talk with you. I've been looking forward to this um, for a while now. I appreciate your patience. It's our first time in our new studio, and you're the inaugural uh, uh, visitor. So, thanks for thanks for coming. Yeah, Brian, thanks for having us, uh, having me here. And uh, again, we've been looking forward to this as well. And I didn't know we were the inaugural yeah. uh, uh, interviewee. So you have a great spot and. Uh, very much looking forward to that conversation. Great. Well, let's get started. Um, do I so, get a badge or anything? You do. Okay. You do on the way out. I actually will color it for you. Okay. So, um, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about yourself. We were just talking off camera, and mm-hmm. you've had, um, I mean, aside from what you're doing right now, mm-hmm. your life has actually been pretty interesting. You were a soccer pay- player at one point in your career? Uh, yeah, I still am. Are you really? Uh, much slower, right? But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, I, I, you know, as I was telling you, I was born and raised in Peru. I um, grew up there, uh, came to the U.S. to go to college with a full intention of finishing and going back. And uh, like I joke about that being one of my, my failures. You know, I never made it back to live there. Uh, obviously, I go back. My, my family is still there. But uh, so, you know, I came to the States in, in 1980, uh, and you know, went to college at, at Stanford and you know, played soccer for Stanford, was actually uh, the captain of the team for a couple wow. of years. And then, back then, um, you know, the, the soccer professional league was the NASL. So I played for the Earthquakes for a year. And really? The whole league went bankrupt in 85. So I probably saw you on the field because yeah. I remember being at an Earthquakes, at lots of Earthquakes yeah. games. Remember that really fast guy running? Yeah. yeah that was me. I. <laughs> I thought I knew you from somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so after that, I actually went back to school. I, I uh, got it, then ended up getting a master's degree in engineering. Um, then I started my career uh, at HP, mm. uh, designing computer systems. You know, and uh, back then HP was you know one of the few just big, uh, very attractive employers in the valley, and um, we had a really fun career there. Um, grew in, in my responsibilities there, and um, all the time I, I kept playing soccer. Now you know now at the there was no professional league till '96 in mm. the states, right? So so it was all more for fun, more you know, not quite amateur, but mm-hmm. but uh, and more yet recreational. Everywhere else in the world, it was a dominant sport. It was, yeah. Now yeah. we're now we're yeah. pretty good, right? So well, because we have uh, what's his name from England, so now we're real, right? <laughs> yeah, he's uh, the coach. You mean? He's, yeah, he's German. Oh, is he? Yeah, he's German. He's a uh, yeah, uh, Klinsman. He's, yeah, very good, great career. And um, so I kept playing all along, and then I you know, actually played for the U.S. indoor national team wow. from '88 to '93. And at that point, I really hung it up. It was you know I was getting old. How much so. do you use sports in what you do in business? A lot, actually, and and I think there's some really great lessons from sports that can be brought into the business world, and I do a fair amount of coaching of those people on my team and and business coaching, you know, and, and other folks that I volunteer my time on, and um, I think there's a lot of great lessons from sports. You know, the, first of all, just the practice. You mm-hmm. know, we, you know, in soccer we practiced all week, we played on the weekends, but every day you were honing your skill, your skills, and. We don't tend not to do that in business. You know, we, we have a, a big presentation coming up or we have a big meeting coming up, and we don't take advantage of the opportunities we have internally to actually go and practice what we're going to go do. Mm. And so we try to instill that note, that concept at SGI where, you know, we take advantage of the opportunities we have to practice what we do. The, the second thing is the teamwork. I mean, I have yet to find any meaningful job that people are doing where they're really working on their own. So the ability to work together, to hold each other accountable for the result is a great lesson that comes from the world of sports. Um, And then the other one I would say is feedback, right? We, uh, you know, playing soccer, soccer is a 90 minute game. At the end of 90 minutes, you know exactly whether you won or lost. And, you know, in business we have projects that last year sometimes and I think it's really important to set milestones so that you know if you're winning or not. Mm-hmm. So you know, you get that feedback much more rapidly than the end of the project, where mm-hmm. 
you know, you might finish it and find out way too late that it really wasn't the right thing to do. So, you know, we try to use those things. I try to use those things when I engage with my team, when I engage with my network of, of peers or competitors, uh, and, you know, and put those lessons into practice. You know, speaking of all the skills that go into being a good, uh, uh, being good at what you do in sports, mm-hmm. in, uh, one of the biggest things that I, that I see is, is uh, being able to stick it through. Yes. Um, it's the endurance that you mm-hmm. have. And, and you're now CEO of a company that has uh, endured quite yes. a bit, um, ups yes. and downs. You guys have, have seen almost more in, in, the, in the ups and the downs of this valley than almost every other company out there. Yes. Um, how, did, how did it endure all that? I mean, it really went through almost collapsing and coming yep. back. And, you know, it, it's yeah. gone through a lot. Yeah, it's, great. it's a great question. Um, I think a lot of it is at the core of SGI, there are certain things that really haven't changed. And you know, SGI was, I believe, founded in 1980 or thereabouts. So, 34 years of ups and downs, some, some pretty deep downs, you know, in the in the 07 era, time 09. Um, but the company has always been uh, focused on innovation. The company has always been focused on bringing, you know, really innovative solutions to customer problems, and that I think has never changed. And you know bad strategies, bad decisions, poor execution, you name it, we've probably seen it all. But at the core of what the company offers to customers is really an ability to help solve really, really important problems that our customers are trying to to solve, and we enable them to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think over time, that has succeeded, has persevered. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, when I rejoined the company, because I actually worked at SGI mm. earlier, and you know, we can talk about that a little bit. Uh, to me, it was really an opportunity to kind of bring SGI back, right? back into prominence, back into an ability to bring these kinds of solutions to big, big problems, uh, and it made it very attractive. And mm. you know, I, th- I think uh, we're on track, which is nice. Mm-hmm. Well, your, your brand has also been associated at one point with some of the biggest blockbuster movies of, yes. of, of our time. Yeah, um, uh, Twister and and um, well, Jurassic and, uh, Park Jurassic is probably Park. The, the most famous one because they actually show the, yeah. the logo of the computers in there. Yeah, and the computing power of what yeah. it took to do those things was uh, phenomenal. But now we've progressed so so far that yeah. um, that the technology isn't needed any longer. But the idea or the thinking behind the processing processing power. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm preaching the choir here. Yeah. But it's it's grown. So yes. now what? And what, what do we do with uh, what? What's next? Well, you know, one of the beauties of being in technology is there's, there's always uh, the needs continue to grow. Right? And so you're right. The, the older SGI was all about graphics computing, right? And that's what enabled some of these great uh, productions to be done. Uh, and then that technology got commoditized, essentially, right? So you didn't need, you know, a big uh, workstation to be able to do the kinds of things that, that we were doing before. Uh, so now we're in, you know, in high-performance computing, and high-performance computing, by the name, you know, tells you that it really is about bringing significant computational capability to solve big problems. And you know, this is getting more commercialized more uh, lately and broader. But you know, big data is bringing you, you know, get extra bonus points for saying big, big data. data by the way. If yeah. I said more, if you say more, now I give you extra All right. points so, on top of that. So, so the big data problems, <laughs> all kidding aside, are really uh, opening areas of inquiry, areas of insight that before the technology didn't exist to really take advantage of it. The reality is we've been dealing with big data for decades. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, a little known fact is that the first time that big data, the word was used um, in the public was in 1996 at the supercomputing show, and it was SGI, mm. who, you know, in its big display talked about big data, right? But today, the, the technology exists to make it almost ubiquitous, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, from marketing, from, you know, retail stores, et cetera, to, to again, real life issues around, around big data are all handled by compute. Mm-hmm. Um, and so while it isn't all graphics computing now, uh, we do have high-performance computing, and, and what we're trying to do is leverage the scale and speed of high-performance computing into the enterprise mm-hmm. and, and, and to tackle data analytics, data management, data problems 
Um, and we're seeing that that is a, you know, a really great field to be in. You know, we see lots of customers that have needs that are significant, that are really impact you know, the world, and, and we play in that. So speed is, is mm -hmm. big. And is when, big. when you look at speed, um, what is that going to give us? Uh, we, we, you know, I, I look at my internet speed yeah. at home, and I'm on <laughs> a, a fast broadband, and I yeah. just want something faster. But yet, at the end of the day, I want it faster because I want all of my kids and my wife and I to be watch, uh, streaming videos at, at the, the same, same time. time. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just not, um, yeah. it's not ever enough. But yeah. when is there ever going to be enough? Well, I think, I think this is one of the, the cases where the answer is probably no, right? We will probably figure out ways to consume whatever bandwidth, whatever speed is given to us in new and innovative ways, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so we'll keep catching up, and then the needs will outgrow wherever we are. Uh, but when you say, you know, what does it give us? I'll give you a couple of examples, because I think that's probably the best way to do it. Um, you know, we're engaged with, with a couple of companies that are doing uh, fraud detection. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, they've, they've moved beyond fraud detection into fraud prevention. So you need to actually analyze massive amounts of data in real time. If you didn't have the computational capability to do that, you can find out that somebody used your credit card or used, you know, uh, you know, put fraudulent postage on, in, in the mail, uh, but you would find out after the fact, where all you can do is call somebody and go, hey, sorry, somebody used your account, mm. instead of actually being able to stop it. Mm. And so the, the speed, the capability of the computing engines uh, that we provide and, and others as well actually enables us to go do that, right? You know, there, there's another uh, mega trend I think that's gonna, we're going to be seeing more and more of, and that is the whole Internet of Things, mm -hmm. right? And I think it pretty soon will probably be called Internet of Everything. Mm -hmm. um, and that, again, is you know, using real-time analytics to actually take action on data that is coming from the endless devices that we're now, you know, wearables, meters, et cetera, et cetera, that are producing data that before wasn't being produced because nothing could do, be done with it. Mm -hmm. So the speed um, of, of the computer engines and the interconnects, mm -hmm. you know, uh, are actually enabling us to do that. So it's important, but again, um, Will it ever be enough? I doubt it. You know, I, I remember. I can't remember who quoted at one point, and it was actually somebody famous in the computer industry who said, "Oh, nobody's going to need more than one megabyte, right?" So, uh, not that long ago. Yeah. So. Uh, I remember. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, to do all of this, um, mm -hmm. you you were talking before about. Um, having uh, played and gone to Stanford mm -hmm. and w how things were back then, um, mm -hmm. just a few years back. And, yeah. and as you were looking at business and where it's progressed today, mm -hmm. um, what kind of um, people are you surrounding yourself with? What, what, mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. Is it going to take the new millennial uh, approach yeah. or, or are we, um, where, where is everything, um, where's yeah. everything going? It's, uh, that, that's, that's a good question. So I think I think it takes all skill sets and, and all um, capabilities to actually continue to push the envelope. Um, so we have folks in our R&D team that have been at SGI since I was at SGI in the late 80s, actually probably before, um, and they have just incredible knowledge of how to design and build the types of ASICs that we need to actually differentiate our computers. At the same time, who's buying our computers, who's buying mm. HPC, who's going to be into the whole big data world. It's a completely different world. So we, in our marketing organization, for example, have a, a much younger people, right? And I don't want to get into talking about ages necessarily, mm. but they provide a more current uh, view of who, how are people buying? How are, how are you needing to market to, to, a, to a new consumer, if you will? And, and so I think it's really important to have diversity, both of experiences, of backgrounds, of uh, you know everything in the makeup of the company, so that we are really current with how do we go out and do business and understand our customers. You know, there's a, an explosion of companies that are all in the software side of big data analytics. Uh, many of them are you know run by by folks that didn't, were not even born when Jurassic Park was mm. <laughs> aired, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, so we need to continue to work with folks that have been in the business 
longer than us and then uh, new entrants into the market. And I think our, our company ought to strive to have that same kind of makeup, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, this is obviously bigger than just what one company can do. It's going to take a lot of partners, I would imagine, to get something like this done, just on the sheer volume of not only data, but the human, um, you know, pieces that fit together for yeah. building something like this. Is this, I mean, are you guys set up with, with yeah. um, partners like that? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's, actually, there's there's two types of folks that are, uh, the ways are of addressing this. One is, you know, people who have the wherewithal to put the entire stack together, and those are very, very, very large companies, uh, the IBMs, HPs of the world. Everybody else is, really has to partner. And I think you know, one of the trends that we see uh, potentially exploding is this move to in-memory databases. You know, they're significantly faster mm. than traditional databases. Um, and for example, we're working with SAP on their HANA program. And you know, that partnership is enabling people to get to real-time data, get to results much, much faster. So we provide, uh, as part of the solution, we provide the largest, uh, more sca most scalable hardware to put everything in memory without, without having to break up the data. And that allows for just fantastic time to answers. Uh, but it, like you said, it takes partnerships, and it isn't just us and SAP. You know, there's then folks that work on applications that sit on top of that of Hana, uh, so that the customers can, you know, depending on what vertical they're in, they have specific solutions for each vertical. So it is really a whole ecosystem working together to solve problems rather than just a single entity. It's the problems aren't that big. So what is um, where you were? You were an engineer. You, mm -hmm. you studied in engineering and. Yeah. Um, where do you see the new engineer? What what is it? How is this progressing? Is 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 an engineer becoming also a marketer, or um, yeah. uh, wh where is that going? Well, I think for starters, I think the some of the better schools are putting together in multidisciplinary uh, programs, right? Where you know I studied electrical engineering and I studied electrical engineering, and that was it, right? And every elective that I took was because I wanted to take it. Um, you know, Stanford has uh, the D school now, the Stanford Design, where they bring different disciplines in engineering, disciplines in marketing, etc. And you know, the the person coming out of that school really has a systems view of things, which is, I believe, completely necessary today. Um, and so, the um, at the same time, these folks are real consumers, mm -hmm. right? And so they get to in interact with the world in a way that maybe we didn't when 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 we were that that age. So yeah, I, I think it's very different. I think the the you know, multidisciplinary faculties, uh, pro degrees that are, that span not only that in particular engineering science, but also uh, elements of you know of the market um, of softer, if you will, sciences are really important. And and I think a lot of schools are actually doing that, and people come out with more complete degrees. I think they're more applicable. Uh, sooner. Mm -hmm. right? we, we did some great engineering and sometimes do you know how to talk to people. Right? <laughs> so, so we had to learn that as, as we as we move mm -hmm. through our careers. So. Well, especially right now, it's such a uh, social world that we all live yeah. in and everything is so transparent yeah. into a company and what we're working on and, and having to hold back and figure out what do we hold back, what are we transparent about, and yeah. when do we release it, it's completely different than yeah. you know it was years ago when everything was kept a secret, just yeah. like Apple, right? I yeah. don't know how Apple does it, but um, but they do it, and it, it's it's a different environment. Yeah. Where do you where do you see that in engineering versus product marketing versus the release of a product? Yeah, I think I mean I think the Apple is unique, frankly, at some level. They have uh, such a ecosystem that they've built uh, that to some extent they could be somewhat self-sufficient. Um, everybody else needs to interact with everybody else. Um, and uh, you know, I don't know, you know I go, we go to big shows, uh, industry shows, and in the past that's where you unveiled your new product, right? I mean, and literally they, they were covered and you took the sure. thing off and you showed it, showed it. If today that product hasn't been already marketed and sold, you missed it because the next product is going to come up before that product has a chance to actually get to market, right? So it, it's a fine line between how early you start promoting what you do, how early you start working with customers on really solving the needs that they have, 
uh, and, and when that becomes public. And I think that the time is shrinking and shrinking. Um, you know, in the past, engineering teams drove a lot of the, the roadmaps, you know, and so what came out next was a very technical product that was a, a technical innovation. And in many cases, it went to look for a problem to solve. Today, if you're not you know, deeply engaged in conversations with customers, not only about what they tell you they need, but even anticipating what they might need, uh, you're, you don't have time to come out with a product that doesn't hit the mark. So that whole dance about disclosure and privacy uh, is very different than, than mm -hmm. in the past. And, uh, and we, I think, all can get better at it. So, um, Speaking of being able to uh, move faster, mm -hmm. uh, you're bringing out products faster, you're, you're looking at things almost even to the level you're talking about this, I think uh, uh, alluding to it before on a predictive level, mm -hmm. a predictive level of theft uh, or a predictive level of business, business analytics across yeah. the board. Yes. Um, so what's, what's going to, uh, where is SGI now? Are you guys here to stay or, and, and what's, what, I mean, are you, are you yeah. getting into predi this predictive level? Uh, so, so let's, let's see. Let me let me give you a, maybe a roundabout answer, but I'll, I'll get to it. We we um, our core products are uh, platforms, if you will. You know, so they're, so they're mostly hardware platforms and compute storage, uh, and we bring service offerings. Uh, but there's a lot of software that actually goes into anything that we do, being out there in the market. Uh, arguably, there's probably more IP in software than in the hardware. Mm. You know, a, a lot of companies are using standard hardware now, right? And so the ways to differentiate around the way that we put it together, so a systems view, uh, uh, we have a lot of innovation around some of the software offerings that we make inside of, of, um, of an open architecture, if you will. Um, and also we have some really creative work around power and cooling for our computers. But on top of that, we are looking to get into the world of machine learning, visualization, et cetera because that's really what helps you get insight, right? And so while in many cases we provide the platform that then you know, gets uh, third-party applications on top of that, uh, we're also uh, bringing back some of the older SGI IP to actually help that. And mm -hmm. so we are in the early stages of bringing that capability back to the market uh, in ways that can, one of the things that I see is a definite trend is with more and more and more data, we are becoming more ignorant about our data. Mm. You know, there's more percentage of the data that we don't know what to do about. So these tools around analytics and really getting insight from the data are critical. Uh, and we have some very compelling intellectual property in that that we want to bring to market. And there's, you know, there's also some very good products today that can do that, but I think it's a great place to, to be. Give me an example of something that's predictive that you think is coming that's going to really revolutionize or help uh, a change or shift sure. something in the future that's that's going to help us understand this. Sure. So, so for example, um, without necessarily naming products, uh, some of our customers are in the in the weather and climate uh, simulation world, and you know the the more that they're able to simulate potential, for, for example, w um, the path of a hurricane or the path of the tsunami, and these are actual real examples uh, where based on the weather data that they had the subfloor of the ocean, the makeup of the subfloor, uh, they were able to actually predict the path of the tsunami uh, with, I, I think it was like seven minutes ahead of what it used to be. Seven minutes is a lifetime when people are given an alert so they can evacuate and they can move. So that's one example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, uh, you see examples all the time where, you know, they're predicting results of voting, uh, Results, right? Mm -hmm. all, all of that is using this kind of uh, software to do predictive analytics. So, and who's the next president? That's all right. Plead the fifth. It's the fifth, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you know the next frontier is is uh, uh, not just predicting it, but actually take preemptive. You know, taking action. Uh, automatically, right? And so we talk, when we talk about some of the stuff we're doing, to move from, you know, automatic to autonomous, right? And, and you see companies like Google, mm -hmm. where, you know, the, the uh, unmanned car, mm -hmm. you know, that is a form of uh, 
you know, autonomous solution, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't just know what is gonna, what's gonna happen, it actually d does it, right? It actually drives, it stops, it turns, and does all mm -hmm. that. So in the world of data, there's a, that same kind of capability, and it's enabled by machine learning. So just analytics won't do it, just visualization won't do it. You, you need the, the data itself to tell you what the right connections, linkages are between the data so it can actually take action. And one of the biggest trends that I that I also have seen, I'm sure you have too, is is how to how to personalize information. Mm -hmm. um, you have so much data that you're looking at. How do you personalize things to make it more human, more approachable, mm -hmm. more acceptable? Mm -hmm. I think Amazon does a really good job of actually giving you something that you're that you're you already yeah, yeah looking for or using. Yeah. Um, but how do you, how how does every business take advantage of that? Is that something that you're also looking at? Yeah. So so for us, the biggest efforts in that area. Uh, are probably in the work that we do in in the life sciences world, right? And so, we work with a number of companies that are doing things like genome sequencing, et cetera. Um, and you know, people talk about personalized medicine, for example, and it, it really is blending research medicine with clinical medicine and treating, uh, bringing basically all the capability to treat an individual. Um, you know, one of the best examples is. Uh, you know, a friend um, who had a cancer, and they were treating him with probably the standard drugs that are used for that type of cancer, and it wasn't uh, very successful. Uh, luckily, the family could afford to do to sequence the genome, uh, and they did it, and it showed that that cocktail of medicine was not going to be successful. They changed it, and it really had an effect. Um, so, you know, the, the true probability of, you know, sequencing a gene was now going way down in cost and in time, mainly enabled by computers uh, that have that capability, uh, to truly be able to do that in close to real time and have an impact on the patients, that's fantastic, right? And that's something that, uh, you know, if we can play a, a small part in, in mm -hmm. enabling, uh, you know, what a great thing for, for the world. Um, and, and so that's one area where we see you know, true personalized data coming into play. Um, and in the other areas, it's really uh, you know, sifting through the massive amounts of data that's consumed by different people and looking at, at patterns of usage of, of whatnot that, again, it's all enabled by, by the analytics that is done mm -hmm. and being able to present you know, a relevant offering instead of just inundate people with you know things that they might not be interested in, and that's a little bit what I talked about earlier. You know, when as we see the consumers changing, right? so the millennials, mm -hmm. um, you know, the way they're gonna buy is very different than the way we're used to buying. Uh, I don't know that they even know what a newspaper is. You know, so advertising in newspapers mm -hmm. might not be right. the right thing. Uh, just the random, uh, even if it's online advertising, they won't pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So it's very personalized. Mm -hmm. you know, um, I have two daughters, one, one's almost 21, the other one's uh, 19. And I think it was like two, three years ago, I walked into a store with her. Literally, the moment she walked in, she got a text from the store that mm -hmm. said, you know, two weeks ago you bought this pair of jeans, here's a discount, two aisles to your left, you'll, you'll find the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, and here's a place for your dad to go have his coffee while yeah. he gives you his credit card. <laughs> yeah, well, he gives you the credit card. That's <laughs> right. so, so that purchase failed. <laughs> but, uh, but, I mean, talk about very, very targeted, right? Yeah. And they don't spend any money on mass marketing, if you will. Right. So it, it, th that whole way to engage with the consumer is definitely changing. Yeah. Well, um, speaking of, about a lot of information, I, um, you are a wealth of, of knowledge, and we could sit here and do this all day, but unfortunately we've, we've run out of time mm -hmm. here. But I wanted to thank you for just being here and, and sharing a little bit of your knowledge uh, here with yeah. us today. My pleasure. It's great to meet you.